This is the Team Church Podcast with Kevin Gerald, where we exist to move church forward and have the conversations that every team needs to be having. Team Church, welcome back to the Team Church Podcast. My name is Brandon Stewart. I'll be your host today for this episode. Uh, We have created this space to have the conversations that every team needs to be having. So we're so excited you're here today and joining us. We're going to tee up a conversation, and we hope you'll continue the conversation at home with your team. So, so glad you're here. And I'm here again with Coach K, Pastor Kevin. Here we go. So glad uh, we're talking about this today. Yeah, we got a, we got a great uh, slot of time ahead of us here today. Also, we have to say it means the world to us. Uh, when you help us make some noise about the podcast, I want to encourage you, if this podcast is resonating with you, hit the subscribe button. However, you're watching, uh, plan to leave a rating, a comment. Also, make some noise on social media, uh, tagging Team Church or hashtag Team Church. Uh, we, we consider it an honor to have a space in your world, and we'd love if you'd share it with someone else who may not yet know about the podcast. Also, before we get into our episode today, we had another great Team DNA story that we wanted to share with you, just something going on in our Team Church tribe. So let's check out this story. What's up, Team Church family? My name is Carrie. And I'm Megan, and we pastor the Movement Church in Orange County, California. And we just want to brag on our amazing team and what they do to move church forward. Absolutely. My favorite thing about them is they're willing to fight for authenticity. What I mean is they're willing to set aside personal agenda, personal opinion to make sure we're advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, they're not afraid of conflict. And and whether that be conflict in a conversation with Carrie and I and something that we're bringing to the table, they're not afraid to push back honorably um, or to do that with one another across the table accountability. Um, I love that they're not afraid of conflict. And I also love that they are willing to be vulnerable because they fight for authenticity and it is making a difference in our church. Realizing we're not trying to push a person's agenda, but God's agenda with the church. I think they've discovered and realized, actually really embraced the fact that we move at the speed of trust. So if we can't trust each other, if we can't bring 100%, and if we can't leave 100% on the table, then man, we'll never go far. We won't be able to push back the gates of hell. But I love the fact that our team is willing to fight for authenticity no matter what it takes. Well, that was an incredible story. And if you'd like to share your team DNA story, why don't you reach out to us on teamchurchconference.com. Share your story. We would love to hear from you, pray for you, walk with you, and uh, potentially feature your story on an upcoming episode of the podcast. Well, Pastor Kevin, I am particularly excited today because we get to talk about something we've been wanting to talk about for a lot of months now, (laughs) and that is your new book coming out, Naked and Unafraid. Uh, We are so, so excited about this. So let me just say that to anyone who's not an author, not familiar with it, the way the whole process works is that you get deep into a topic, you give it your best. You put all of your attention, your focus, your heart, your mind for months, sometimes years, and then you're told to be quiet. Like you can't even (laughs) talk about it. You can't use it in messages. You can't until the book comes out, which is like a year later. Yeah. So yeah, we have been anxious to get into this and talk about it. Well, here we go. We're going to give it a shot. And if you're watching this today, you're a pastor, you're a leader, you're going to want to get your hands on a copy of the book. In fact, it's available to pre-order today everywhere books are sold. Uh, I'd encourage you to do it. It's going to help you personally. It's going to help our teams. And it's through a leadership lens and a a team building lens that we're going to look at this book today and just try to unpack uh, some truths from it. But get us started, Pastor Kevin. Where did this title even come from? <laughs> Naked did and Unafraid. Where did the title come from? <laughs> uh, actually, the title was up for debate as to whether we would use it or not. I wanted it uh, all along, but the publishers had the final word. I'm so glad they liked it. I wanted to go with it, but um, here's, here's where it comes from. It comes from, first of all, let me, let me go back to a meeting that we have with some of our team where I was asking them to let me know for the purpose of sermon prep, what are the biggest felt needs that people have? in their life right now. So they brought me a list and one of them was the need for vulnerability. And they had done, I mean, this is good research. This isn't just ask your friend or go home, think about it kind of thing. 
So anyway, I questioned them, and I'm like, I don't like that. I've never liked that word. <laughs> but the more we discussed what people were really looking for around this word, um, we came up with this topic and this title. So uh, we, we, uh, what we have is we have the paralleling, uh, the paralleling dynamics or a picture of two people. One of them is Michael, which was Saul's daughter, mm -hmm. who married David. Yep. And there's a scene where David is, as the king, as a young novice king, is bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, something he'd always dreamed of doing and, and being a part of. So he is out dancing in the streets, and most of us know that story. He's dancing in the streets. She's sitting in a window fuming. She's angry. She's mad. And then the confrontation came later in the day. And she said, who do you think you are? You're out there naked in the street. Well, he wasn't actually without any clothes on, but he had shed the kingly protocol robe, like the robe that the outer garment that kings were to appear in public wearing. He didn't have that on. And he went down to something more comfortable to dance in and to just join in the public party in the streets. So the whole book, the premise of the book is this, and that is that everyone makes decisions that either make you a window watcher or a street dancer. Hmm. And that's the premise of the book, creating within all of our hearts. And I've certainly grown my appetite personally through this process to be that person who is not sitting in the window when I have the opportunity to dance in the street. Well, and I know that you feel really convicted right now about the idea that how we define vulnerability is really limiting our ability to have conversations that we need to be having, how we define it. Exactly, because the, the definition that I had in my mind is what I think many people have, uh, let's start by telling you that I am a D personality um, and, <laughs> no and I am an eight on an Enneagram. <laughs> and so vulnerability is not my deal. Like that is not <laughs> what I would say I am, I am good at by wow. nature. Um, so I think there's a lot of people like me, um, not necessarily the same on the personality chart or whatever, but I think a lot of us, when we define vulnerability, immediately we're afraid of that. We think, mm. whoa, whoa, wait, nobody comes out good when you are vulnerable. Like, you can't be vulnerable. Nobody should be vulnerable. And that's definitely, um, I think, a mindset that I've wrestled with, struggled with, and I understand if you feel that way today. Uh, but that's why the book exists, is to present something differently so than good. that and to appeal to the power of living, actually, a life that is open, that risk exposure, that abandons smallness, yep. Yep. so that you can be everything you're meant to be. You said this recently to me. You said, I'm surprised at how many leaders lead small, mm. how many leaders live small, mm -hmm. people that may have influence. So, so let me explain that because I would not even been able to say that uh, some time ago because I wasn't aware of it as much as I am now sure. in my own life. So I want to put myself in that category, not just as one who's observing other leaders, but the more I realize the difference between what we're calling internal smallness and getting big on the inside, those, the difference in those two, I'm amazed at how many of us who are leading are battling our own internal smallness and just hit the wrong button, put us in the wrong space, wrong place, wrong time, particular conversations, and walls will go up, we will retreat, we will go into protective mode, we will snap back, we will pounce, we will do all sorts of yep. uh, emotional action and reaction coming from a place of what I'm calling smallness. And again, this is a struggle I have. I think we all have. I'm certainly not putting myself 
in a, in a place and say, I conquered it all. <laughs> I've got it all. <laughs> I'm just wanting to have more conversation because I think that, that as leaders, it's really important to be self-aware of this dynamic of smallness that many great leaders actually are leading from a smallness. That's true. And I'd love if you'd take a minute and read that section of the book where it you kind of give language to internal smallness, because no doubt there are teams watching, pastors watching. Uh, what does this look like on a team when a team is leading from a place of internal smallness? So I want to read a few of them, um, maybe not get to all of them, but I'm going to do it slow enough so that you're, you can you can grab hold of what I'm saying. Uh, internal smallness affects us in, in, in a number of ways. So, for example, it causes us to be self-conscious. So self-conscious, even as a speaker, I can't really do well as a communicator. Man, that's so true. If I'm thinking about myself. Yep. If I'm wondering if my hair's messed up, my tie's <laughs> crooked, you know, uh, something on my teeth. People thinking I'm I'm ridiculous, or if I'm self-conscious, it undermines my effectiveness. And so, as a leader, uh, when you're too self-conscious, you're not team-conscious. You're not conscious of the bigger picture, and you're working from a smallness within you. Uh, it causes us to be slow to compliment and encourage other people. It causes us to be slow to celebrate the wins of other people. Wow. It causes us to actually be envious of other people's success. Yep. And a lot of what leaders deal with on teams, for example, is like comparison. Yep. And why do we do that? And when we're envious of other, there's something small about that. And we all know this in our heart, but this is what we're talking about. This is where we want to expand our dialogue. Uh, internal smallness also can cause us to shrink ourselves to stay as small a target as possible so that the world won't shoot us down. Mm. So I have pastor friends that are very nervous about talking about money. They're um, very yeah. nervous about approaching certain topics. They're very nervous about getting the disapproval of some people in their congregation that maybe they won't stay with me if we go this route. Wow. What are we talking about? We're talking about an internal smallness that is limiting our potential as individuals. It causes us to pass up opportunities to contribute. So maybe you're at a table today. Maybe you're invited to a table of conversation today. But maybe you are too nervous about saying the wrong thing or being rejected, your idea being rejected, that you actually don't enter in freely into the conversation. Um, internal smallness can cause us to take things too personally. Internal smallness can cause us to assume w the worst in people or other people around us. And maybe some of you are not just as a leader, but you could think right now of people you work with, people that are on your teams, and some of this kind of stuff going on is what we're defining as internal smallness. Well, wow. It can cause us to put the focus on what we want to avoid instead of what we want to accomplish. Mm. So we're focusing so on, you know, in sports, like that'll mess you up in a heartbeat if you're like, I don't want to miss the shot. I don't want to miss the shot. Like if you're worried about that in basketball... If you're, worried, if you're a quarterback and all you're thinking about is an interception, interception, interception. Yeah, you won't throw the ball. You won't throw the ball. Yeah. And you won't complete passes and you won't be your yep. best. So that's yep. what we're talking about. Pushing past internal smallness so that we were thinking about what we want to accomplish, not being embarrassed by a mistake. Um, should I go on here? Or will you well, to man, I feel <laughs> like I am sitting on the couch with my counselor here for a second. I mean, I feel like this is really going to do some heart surgery on those of us that lead in ministry. We need to be having these conversations. Mm. And 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 I thank you for giving this language to highlight, man, I'm living small right now. Um, because I think that's a point of awareness we all need to have. That's what I hope. I, I mean, here we are doing a podcast and you're receiving it on your end and we're giving it on our end. My dream, my, my hope is that we could take the book and take 
areas like this and within the context of our friends and the people we work with, like we could read these kinds of things and then have a conversation about it. Absolutely. Take a minute and give us some language now on what does the bigger me sound like. So I like the bigger me a lot more than I do too. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to if I'm going to abandon smallness yeah. and internal smallness, okay, what does big me sound like? Well, the the bigger me is the me that gives me permission to make mistakes. Mm. It gives me permission to speak up, to help out, to go to new places in faith and, you know, with confidence that right now the, the mini me would hold me back from. I tell a, a story in the book about when I was a little guy and came home, my dad was pulling in the driveway and I came home one day from down the street with some of my friends and they had bullied me a little bit and uh, a guy on our street had bullied me and I came home and I was walking across the front yard headed toward my house to my mama and my dad pulls in in the driveway at the same time. He sees that I'm kind of shook up gets out of his car and says, hey, Kevin, and just kind of, hey, what's up, buddy, you know, and, and I just start running at that point toward the house. Like, I don't want dad. I want, I want, <laughs> I want mommy, you know, <laughs> and so I felt bullied. I felt pushed around. I felt, you know, um, small, and so after that whole, the drama of all of it, and mom held me a little bit, and, <laughs> you know, all, my, my, my mom left the room. My dad took over. And my dad said, hey, buddy, let me just tell you, you, you don't take that anymore. And that day, my dad started giving me fight lessons, basically. <laughs> um, and he said, you, you don't, you, you, look, we're, you're, you're, you can take care of yourself. And you don't, have to, you don't have to do that. And what started that day was a conversation that allowed me to have permission to not be intimidated or pushed around and to start pushing back. And my dad had always, they had always taught me, of course, you don't, we don't fight. And so now he was giving me chapter two of the book, and that is that neither do we allow people to push us around. Hmm. So we don't start fights, but when you're being bullied, you don't have to put up with being bullied. Hmm. And so that began another maturity level in me to be able to you know, throw my shoulders back, and start growing into the next dimension of not being pushed back into a corner. So my point is that the bigger me was given permission to emerge, and the bigger me is more confident. The bigger you is more full of faith. The bigger you is willing to risk, you know, some pain in the process. So good. Maybe getting a bloody nose in the process, <laughs> but I'm not going to run away. When my moment comes and my opportunity comes, I, I, I'm going to be strong. I'm going to lean in. I'm going to do what we call in the book risk exposure uh, in pivotal moments. And out of that, I'm not just trying to be a mean person. I'm not. And the goal is not to be a bully toward other people. The goal is to stand in a place of confidence that I am who God says I am and I'm able to be mature, healthy, strong, and still lean into life. I don't have to back away from yep. life. That's so well said. And that actually takes us to the first section of the book, which is what we wanted to talk about for a minute today before this episode is done. And that is risk exposure. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the starting place yep. for us if we're, if we're gonna walk this out, is we're gonna have to risk exposure. So I'm just gonna let you go for a minute and tell us what do you mean by risking exposure? Well, I, I think that there's always the uh, cause and effect that we all process. And we always measure consequences. Um, you know, what's the consequences if I have this conversation? Uh, what's the consequences if I'm honest with my, my uh, coworker, somebody else on my team, and I have that kind of conversation? What's the consequences of that? And whatever it might be, risking exposure 
is saying that, sure, there's a right time and there's a right place, and we're not advocating getting naked with anyone anytime. What we are saying is that the better life, the healthier life, is a life that is willing to go into difficult places and spaces of conversation with the goal of coming out with a win hmm. and creating a win-win for our team, for our life, for our future. Um, so that, that's really risking exposure. And of course, the story of David that I told a while ago uh, is the big one. Let me, let me just tell you like a couple of examples really quick of why I admired David so much, and maybe yeah. we can apply that. But the reason I admire him is because here he is, uh, a shepherd boy who has no, he has really no experience as a king. Royalty is not something he knew a lot about. Mm. And he ends up being beckoned by, he being called out of the field by Samuel. And then in front of his older, all older 11 brothers. Right. Brought to center stage. Right. Well, how do you feel in that moment? Like, and boom, the, the oil cap, the, the cap is off the horn of oil. It's poured over your head. Like, and, and you could by sh start shrinking in that moment. You could feel very humble. Like, like, oh my, I don't belong here, right? Well, the fact that David was able, however he did it, to be able to keep on stepping into those opportunities that ended up being a king. And then as a king, he was still able to dance in the streets with the, with the commoner. Mm. The, the beauty of that, you know, killing a giant in the process. And by the way, another thing that happened to him out on the battlefield was his older brother, Eliab, said, what are you doing here? How come you're out here? And he starts like quarreling with him and calling him names. How does a guy like David continue to get through the criticism and get through what other people think and opinions and keep going where he's going. Well, here's the deal. It's opposite of Saul, his king. Saul came out as a young man of the fields to a battle where they needed a hero, and he did that, much like David, but then he started living in fear of David. He started mm -hmm. being intimidated by David. The mm -hmm. up and the coming were driving him crazy. He started protecting what he had. Right. So you've got this, these two very different characters. And, and so when you start risking exposure, it's whatever stage you're at in life. If you're, if you're a king and you've been a king for a long time and there's some up-and-coming people around you, exposure is going to look like cheering them on. It's going to look like getting behind them, supporting them, like saying, I'm with you and I'm for you. If, on the other hand, you're the young, it looks like honoring those who are in front of you, lifting them up, risking exposure so that you can move forward and be all you're meant to be. It's so good. And helping? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I loved the line in that section where you talk about playing safe is dangerous. Yeah. That I love the tension in that, that if I play it safe, if I don't step into this, I'm actually living I'm limiting my, my life. I'm limiting my future. So here's a definition of vulnerability. I don't think we've said this yet. Vulnerability, the definition I, you know, I'm putting on it for the sake of the book is making a move with no guarantee of the outcome. Mm, that's so good. So this is why the complexity of this and the application individually is something that I hope the book can help flesh out that individuality in this because we're all somewhere right now where we're hesitant to make moves some kind of situation and vulnerability means making moves when you have no guarantee of the outcome so rather than staying in safe places safe places are dangerous mm. like that's dangerous you, you are risking the possibilities of a better life a greater future, God's call on your life. If you just play it safe, you're never going to face a giant. You're, you're never going to be in places where, you know, you're, you're risking exposure because you're playing it too safe. Mm -hmm. So the, the call, the beckoning, the encouragement is to just keep on making moves, whatever that move is. 
Keep on making moves even when you don't have a guarantee of how it's going to go or the outcome of it all. So good. What does street dancing look like on our teams? I mean, if we're going to walk this out, I'm a team member. I'm on a church team somewhere. What does street dancing look like yeah, to me? Well, it, it, first of all, it just means all in. Like street dancing means I'm all in. Like mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not in pretend corner. I'm not in poser mode (laughs) i'm not in observation spaces i'm i'm all in and i'm I'm not playing it safe and i'm i'm uh i'm teachable i'm willing to risk uh you know being corrected Mm. um i am unoffendable at the end of the day wow um, you know, I, I might feel offended, but I will not live offended. So therefore I am, I'm in the street. Like, let's just abandon the smallness and be really, really big. Um, and doing that again, I, I hope that no one is discouraged. Like, Oh my goodness, this just sounds so <laughs> start where, start where you are, because none of us are, really have all this down. Yep. And you will constantly have a wrestling match with the many me. But um, dancing in the streets for a staff member, that's mm. what it looks like. All in. Um, I'm correctable. I'm not beyond being wrong. If I get my feelings hurt today, I'll be over tomorrow because I won't be living offended. I'm willing to take risk. Um, challenge me. Push me. Stir me. Uh, and I'll do that with other people, do my best to, you know, be the kind of person that provokes people to good works, that creates uh, a permission giving community in our team so that people know that they can maybe get it wrong. And I'm not just going to pounce uh, <laughs> on them because we're, we're wanting to all be better. And that's what dancing looks like. I feel like if I do this as a team member, I get the best out of you as my leader. And if I just give you permission and you know that you can't offend me and um, like I ain't going nowhere and I'm going to keep showing up, I feel like I get the best out of you. I get the best coaching. I get the best wisdom. Yeah. And, and I'm actually, um, I'm for you. Like I'm, yeah. I'm you, you win yep. me over. Yep. I think we have a lot to talk about on this and we got to all of one section of the book today (laughs) and there's a good four more left. So we're going to keep this conversation going right on the podcast um, while we make our way through this book. I'm so thankful you wrote it. I do have one more question for you before we land the plane today. And that's that I feel like getting this conversation right matters because it directly impacts our ability to reach our communities. Mm -hmm. Too many people view the church as fake or too buttoned up, not willing to get to the real stuff of where we really live. So mm-hmm. maybe just talk about that for a minute. This really matters that our churches, we get this culture right. Yeah, I, I feel uh, the significance and the weight of what you're saying, uh, Brandon, because I, I do feel like that we're in a culture today who labels us as fake. Like that's the quick, fast, bottom line opinion they have about us and if we can just chip away at that one day at a time one conversation at a time one testimony at a time one story at a time if we can find ways to open ourselves up uh to saying you know what i'm not perfect and i'm dealing with this right now and i'm going through that and i have had that struggle and i know what that's like i know how you feel so being empathetic opening our lives up, making church not a place where people walk in and feel like, wow, you know, um, everybody's perfect here, it, but rather a place where no perfect people are really allowed. Right. Like, that's the whole right. goal of the church. Right. Um, I feel like that's when we began to be light. We began to be salt. We start really impacting, you know, our communities with a level of honesty and openness because we're, we're vulnerable. 
So good. Thank you for writing this. We're going to keep the conversation going. And no doubt that if you're listening to this today, this is resonating with you. And if it is, I want to encourage you to head to anywhere books are sold. Place your orders today. If you're listening to this or watching this and this is pre-release, that the book release is on February 4th. If it's pre-release, make sure to pre-order your books. Plan to take your church through the series, we would just count it an honor if you'd go on this journey with us and I think our churches can be better, our teams can be better, so join us in that. Also, again, if the podcast is resonating with you, I want to encourage you to hit the subscribe button, plan to make this a part of your your month as a team, and we've now started a conversation. Why don't you go and finish the conversation with your team? So Team Church, we love you. Uh, we're thankful for you. We're, we're grateful to get to do this every single month. Yep. Until next time, know that we're walking with you, we're praying with you. God bless you. God bless you guys. This has been the Team Church Podcast with Kevin Gerald. For more information on conferences and events, check out teamchurchconference.com.